Okay, this last part of this lecture might be a little longer. We're going to talk about enzymes and how energy relates to use of enzymes in the cell. Enzymes, just remember DJ enzyme breaks it down, okay? Enzymes are really important in biological systems for breaking things down, also for putting things back together. Okay, so what are enzymes? Enzymes are proteins. That is really important to remember. They are protein molecules that speed up a chemical reaction without themselves being used by the reaction. So they aren't part of the reaction, they just make the reaction happen faster. Much like a matchmaker, right, doesn't get involved in a relationship, it's, matchmaker just, you know, introduces two people to each other and lets the sparks fly, okay? The enzyme is the matchmaker. Enzymes usually have names that end in A-S-E, and the first part of the name tells you what it does. So lipase breaks down lipids. Get it? Lipid? Lipase? Get it? Okay. Protease breaks down proteins. Lactase breaks down lactose, which is a sugar. And if you don't remember from previous lectures, anything that ends with O-S-E is a sugar. So if it ends in A-S-E, it's an enzyme, and it's an O-S-E, it's a sugar. Now, not all enzymes end in A-S-E, but... Whenever you see something whose name ends in ASE, it's an enzyme. Okay, so why is this important? Enzymes are going to help reactions happen. So here's a little graph of the energy required to go from a reactant, which is this big molecule, to two products, which is this reactant broken in two. The activation energy is the energy that it requires to start this uh, reaction. So um, in order for reactions to happen, we have to break bonds or create bonds or rearrange bonds. Whenever we do that, molecules absorb energy. It requires energy to break bonds. And um, that energy required to get the reaction started is the activation energy. Okay? Even if the reaction will then continue on without any help, there's always a little bit of energy that's required to get it started. Think of this as uh, striking a match. You put a little bit of energy into the match as you strike the match that starts the reaction and then the reaction continues burning the match without you having to do anything. Okay, so enzymes lower the activation energy. They make it easier to start the reaction. In biological systems, this is really important because the biological system usually doesn't have enough energy on its own to make the reaction happen. So the reaction can't happen without the presence of the enzyme, all right? So in your chemistry class, you know, you can just heat something up to provide more energy to a system to make an enzyme work. In biology, we have homeostasis, and you can't do that. All right. Each enzyme recognizes one molecule that it is going to work with, and that is called the substrate. So each enzyme is going to do a specific reaction. The active site on the enzyme is where that substrate fits in. Okay, and it's actually shaped, physically shaped, uh, to fit that substrate, whatever that molecule or molecules are. Uh, when the substrate binds to the enzyme, the enzyme and the substrate actually change their shape a tiny little bit, and that's called the induced fit model of enzyme enzymes. Um, remember that when you change the shape of a protein, you change what it does. So by changing the shape of the enzyme, which is a protein, we're going to make the protein do something. Okay, so changing shape enables breaking the bonds or putting two things close enough together that they can create a bond. So here's an example where we're going to break a bond. Here's our enzyme. Let's say this is lactase. It has this special active site with this specific shape shaped like the substrate. Here's our substrate, the lactose disaccharide. It's two simple sugar molecules bound together. The substrate binds to the enzyme. The enzyme changes shape a little. You can't really tell in this diagram. Just trust me on that one. And then catalysis happens. Catalysis is just the term for the enzyme making the reaction happen. And then 
the products are released from the enzyme, in this case, the simple sugars, the monosaccharides, galactose, and glucose, and then the enzyme is now ready to bind to another su substrate and do the whole thing again. It isn't affected by the reaction happening, okay? It's the matchmaker. It can go on and, you know, introduce another couple. All right, now you may be wondering, what about this H2O over here? Sorry, this is a little more dramatic than I expected. I was having fun last night with my graphics. I guess I got over dramatic. So the, the water here, this is a specific kind of reaction that you do need to know, and it is called a hydrolysis reaction. In the products, each of the products gets part of the water molecule. So we're gonna split the H2O into an H and an OH. One monosaccharide is gonna get the OH, one is gonna get the H, and then they both become complete monosaccharide molecules. Now, we don't have to split a sugar in a dehydration, or excuse me, a hydrolysis reaction. It just splits water. So any reaction that splits water as a part of the reaction, and then the parts of water are bound to the products, that's a dehydration, I'm getting them mixed up, a hydrolysis reaction. And the reason I keep saying dehydration is because that's the opposite reaction. I'm getting them mixed up. Hydrolysis, split water. So hydro means water, lysis means split. Anytime you see lice or lysis splitting something. Um, so in this case, hydrolysis splitting water. Okay, so let's talk about these two reactions, dehydration and hydrolysis. Dehydration is actually going to remove water from a molecule or from two reactants, excuse me, um, to create a larger molecule. Hydrolysis is going to split water uh, to create two smaller molecules. Often these are reversible reactions. So you can put something get it together, take it back apart. So um, in cows, mammary glands, um, that uh, lactose sugar is going to get made by um, putting galactose and glucose together uh, in a dehydration reaction that produces water. And then in your body, if you drink milk and can do this because you make lactase, some of us don't anymore, um, you can, when that breaks apart, the water is then added and split. Okay? All right, so here's uh, what that looks like uh, in chemical symbols. Here's the two sugars. We have the OH on one, the H on the other. Um, when we put these two together and create a chemical bond there, we use this O, this oxygen, and take this, the H2O that results, make water. Okay, that's a dehydration synthesis. It removes water from the molecules involved and forms a water molecule. Hydrolysis, we add water, split the water, put an H on one and OH on the other, and voila. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Huh? All right, going back to enzymes or proteins, remember that proteins can be denatured by heat, by uh, acidic conditions, but also by basic conditions. So enzymes work within a very narrow range of temperature and pH, usually. They're usually very specific to certain environments. Um, and a lot of times, high temperatures will denature a protein, low temperatures uh, will actually take enough energy out of a system that the enzyme doesn't have enough, the, the system doesn't have enough energy for the enzyme to make the reaction work. They don't often denature a protein with cold temperatures. But because of this and because uh, enzymes have a specific environment in which they work, homeostasis is really important because maintaining that environment, whatever it is, inside the cell or the organism uh, means that the enzymes are in the right environment to do their work. How cool is that? So in this week's lab, you're actually going to um, examine the effect of changing pH and temperature on an enzyme. Now, in natural systems, we don't always want an enzyme to be working. Um, for example, let's take lactase. If you have not eaten something uh, including lactose, the sugar that's most commonly in milk, um, you don't need to have lact lactase. Um, now, some cells will make lactase and then inhibit it until the lactose is present. 
So those are called inhibitors, which is a molecule that binds to an enzyme to make it not do whatever it does. It changes its shape. Remember, changing shape of a protein changes its function. In this case, the inhibitor changes the shape of the protein and stops it from binding to the substrate. So let's see what that looks like. So here's an enzyme. Here's the active site. The substrate would bind to the active site and do whatever it was going to do. Now, the inhibitor, notice, has a really similar shape to the substrate. This binding area of the inhibitor matches the active site of the enzyme, and the inhibitor binds to the active site, so the substrate can't bind. That's called a competitive inhibitor, meaning that it's, it outcompetes the substrate, and it blocks the actual active site. What if the inhibitor works differently by, by binding in a different place and changing the shape of the protein. That's what a non-competitive inhibitor or an allosteric inhibitor does. And what it's going to do is it's going to bind somewhere else, which causes the protein to change shape so that the active site doesn't match the substrate anymore. Either way, the enzyme can't bind to the substrate and can't do its normal function. These are natural things that are always present in a lot of biological systems so that we can turn enzymes on and off as they're needed within a cell, okay? Um, allo is a really important prefix to remember. Allo means other or away. Um, so whenever you see allo, think of that. All right, some important uh, medicines work this way by um, blocking an enzyme by inhibiting an enzyme. So penicillin, the antibiotic, um, blocks an enzyme in bacteria that bacteria use to make cell walls when they reproduce. And so without making cell walls, the bacteria isn't complete and can't work. And so that's how penicillin kills bacteria. Some cancer drugs block enzymes that are necessary for cell division, literally stopping your cells from dividing. Yeah, cancer drugs can be scary. Ibuprofen um, inhibits the enzyme that helps your neurons send pain signals. And so your the pain is still happening, it's just not getting, the signal is not getting sent to your brain. Your brain goes, cool, I don't hurt anymore, awesome. Now, depending on the way that an enzyme works, whether it's competitive or non-competitive, it can actually change um, the reaction rate of the enzyme. So here's a graph that shows the rate of reaction. So here's no reaction. Here's the fastest reaction. And then the concentration of the substrate. So how much of, for example, lactose is available for the enzyme to work on. And of course, there's always a maximum rate at which an enzyme can work just because there's a maximum number of enzyme molecules available. So normally, without any inhibitor, um, the enzyme is going to uh, increase its rate of reaction very quickly as the substrate uh, concentration includes or increases, and then it kind of level off as it reaches that maximum as all of the enzyme molecules are busy, essentially. The competitive inhibitor is going to affect the rate of reaction, but not the maximum, okay, because there's still the same level of enzymes available to either bind to the competitor, the inhibitor, or the substrate. The non-competitive inhibitor is actually going to reduce the rate of reaction by taking enzymes out of use and making them not even available for the reactions. Okay, that's just something to think about. All right, the other thing we can do besides inhibiting an enzyme is we can actually activate an enzyme to make it more likely to bind to the substrate. And those are called activators. An allosteric activator binds to a site away from the active site to change the shape of the enzyme and make it more likely to bind to the substrate. So this actually shows uh, an inhibitor, which a uh, blocks the uh, substrate and uh, an activator which uh, makes the uh, enzyme more likely to bind. This enzyme has four parts and four active sites so it can actually do four reactions all at once.
Okay, now to help our enzymes, we have things called cofactors and coenzymes. Uh, coenzymes is a term we're going to use more often. I just want you to note there are two of these. So cofactors and coenzymes are something that help the enzyme bind. Okay, so they might be um, activators or they might help in some other way. It can get really complicated. Okay, just need you to know they help. So cofactors are ions. Any ion that binds to an enzyme to help it do whatever it does. DNA polymerase binds to a zinc ion before it can copy DNA. Now here's another enzyme whose name tells us what it does. ASE says it's an enzyme. DNA means it makes DNA polymer. Polymer is a long chain. DNA polymerase actually creates a polymer of DNA. It actually makes a DNA uh, molecule by copying another strain of DNA. Coenzymes are molecules that help a, uh, a reaction happen. And when we get to cellular respiration, which is our next lecture, uh, we're going to have a couple of really, really important coenzymes whose job is to carry hydrogen ions um, from one place to another to transfer um, energy to help other reactions do their job. And those are NADH and FADH2. You don't need to know about those right now. You'll learn them later. Anyway, those are required for ATP to be made inside the mitochondria of cells. How cool is that? All right, some other important coenzymes are vitamins. And the reason you need your vitamins is so that your body can have these coenzymes to function properly. Most of these your body cannot make by itself. You have to get them from your food. So um, the reason that you need to eat lots of different foods and foods that have vitamins in them is so that you can have all of the vitamins that you need so that your cells can do all of the processes that they need to do. Um, yeah, sure, you could take a multivitamin. Um, whether the multivitamin has in it what it says it has, um, it may, it may not. Um, there, no one is checking. They are not regulated by the FDA, so no one's actually checking to make sure they actually have what they say they have. Um, and second, your body absorbs vitamins better in the form of food. So it's better to just eat lots of different colors of real food. Um, so I don't mean different colors like all the colors of Skittles, okay? Although Skittles are good. Um, but make sure that you get green leafy vegetables and colorful fruits and meats and grains and everything because you need all of the vitamins from all of that in order for everything to work correctly. Because your enzymes in your cells need to be able to do their matchmaking part or be DJ enzyme and break it down. That is what you need to know about enzymes, my friend. Up next, we will learn about cellular uh, respiration, how the cells make ATP.